To be small does not necessarily mean to be insignificant or incapable. Israel stands as proof of that. Since its founding, the country has stood its ground against unlikely odds and did so repeatedly. The Israeli Defense Forces are the envy of many NATO member states. The country fields an expensive, high-tech military that includes cutting-edge air and missile defense systems, stealth fighters, as well as advanced intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance capabilities. Meanwhile, Israeli industries have produced a batch of impressive weapons, ranging from drones, tanks and missiles to satellites and cybersecurity. Yes. Israel has done well for itself in terms of creating an indigenous aerospace and defense industry. And the world has taken notice. Tiny Israel ranks among the 10 leading exporters of major weapons globally. Israeli weapons have been employed far and wide, sometimes even tilting the tactical battlefield. Yet, it is precisely this pursuit of high-tech superiority against low-tech adversaries such as Hamas that has clouded its foresight, suggesting the Israelis might be more dressed for the parade and not necessarily for the battle. Before getting into the video, I need to quickly tell you about another tech proliferation, the data broker market. So what happens is that your personal information, including your name, login credentials, social security number, home address, etc. is packaged and sold or published online without you even knowing about it. I find this frustrating. Up until a few months ago, I used to get these weird robocalls from abroad. My inbox tended to be stuffed with junk emails and so on. This is where Incogni comes in. It goes out and makes requests to hundreds of data broker lists and tries to get me off the list. By law, these companies are required to comply. The process is incredibly tedious by design, so most people don't even bother. Incogni, however, makes this process easy and automated. Since I signed up, my phone has been quieter, my email has been more focused and I feel a lot better knowing that my personal information is not abused by companies using my browser history to jack up my premiums. There's a link in my description. It's incogni.com slash Caspian report. You can sign up for the annual plan to get 60% off. You do the annual plan so that Incogni can constantly scrub you off these lists because you're always being added to new lists. When you click the link, it helps support the channel. So please use the link, but you also get that discount. Thank you, Incogni, for sponsoring today's video. Israel is a major player in the global arms market, but that's hardly news. Those who disapprove of the country find it a source of resentment, while those who approve of Israel find it a source of empowerment. But whatever one's political preferences, to understand the Israeli arms industry is to understand the state of Israel, especially in these polarized and troubled times. When the country came into being, its military consisted of a ragtag band of militias who barely had the means to produce ammunition for their firearms. The government had to import weapons from established defense industries, often covertly and illegally. While this arrangement worked well enough in the early years of state building in the 1970s, however, things took a turn for the worse. Israeli lawmakers had made a terrible geopolitical mistake. You see, up until that period, France had been Israel's main arms supplier. But following the Six-Day War in 1967, the French decided otherwise and abruptly cut Israel off. No more fancy warplanes and tanks. At the same time, the Soviets began pouring massive amounts of sophisticated weapons into the surrounding Arab nations. Soon after, in 1973, another devastating armed conflict broke out. It was the fourth major war between Israel and the Arab states. Israel emerged victorious again, but the next round of hostilities was already brewing and there was no guarantee that Israel would enjoy military superiority the next time around. 
More importantly, the 1973 conflict exposed a strategic vulnerability for the Israelis, their dependence on foreign military suppliers. If Israel was to survive the next few decades, it had to do something different, drastically so. And since it could never match the Arabs in terms of manpower, weapons and finances, Israel could either innovate or disappear. That imminent danger of total annihilation was a driving force for nationwide reform. It sharpened the mind. And just like that, Israel embarked on a large-scale program to foster new defense industries. Israeli lawmakers tapped into the Jewish tradition of scholarship and channeled these human resources into research and development. A substantial proportion of GDP was devoted to this, more so than any other country. At the same time, a new military unit known as the Talpiat Project was created, where recruits were tasked to observe and innovate. Members of Talpiat had previously demonstrated outstanding academic ability in science and leadership potential. They were selected and embedded in every branch of the Israeli military, from infantry, artillery and engineering to intelligence and aerospace. The Talpiat recruits learned the ins and outs of the military and then joined the research and development program. Similar training programs were later created to attract even more talent into the ranks of the military. For instance, a special program was set up to encourage the employment of veterans in high-tech and engineering companies. So, if you were part of a tank crew and had experience in armored warfare, you would be encouraged to join the development of combat vehicles. Moreover, while these reforms were being applied, Israel did something else that was quite unusual. It dismantled the bureaucracy that separated military officials from scientists and entrepreneurs. As a result, the military was able to communicate its needs swiftly and efficiently to legislators, investors and academics. This close connection was then applied within the military hierarchy itself. For example, while most armed forces frown upon arguments between senior officers, in Israel it has become an acceptable practice. Junior soldiers were free to argue with senior officers because it fostered creativity and rejected group thinking. To this day, these reforms remain unique to the State of Israel, and they are almost impossible to replicate because no other nation lives on the brink of destruction. In the years that followed, the indigenous Israeli defense industry would prove its ingenuity in the face of strategic and tactical realities. For instance, in the 1970s, during the sporadic attrition war between Israel and Egypt, the Israelis lacked intelligence on Egypt's military deployments on the Suez Front. At the time, the Sinai Peninsula was under Israeli control following the Six-Day War in 1967. Israel needed intelligence on what awaited them on the other side of the banks. So, Israeli researchers developed a toy plane that could fly for long periods and carry a camera. It was the first military spy drone and it provided invaluable intel on Egyptian trenches built along the Suez Canal. The success of this toy plane laid the foundation for the high-end Israeli drones we know today, and the drones that followed would play a crucial role in the conflicts with Syria. Meanwhile, at around the same time, Israel was in talks with Britain to acquire a new type of main battle tank. The deal was about to be signed, but the British had a change of heart at the last moment. So, Israel tapped into the human resources of its veterans and came up with its own indigenous tank known as the Merkava. The tank was rolled out within a few years and quickly became the hallmark of the Israeli defense industry. Years later, in the mid-1970s, the Americans provided the Israelis with new methods of satellite surveillance, but the system was not good enough. Lacking strategic depth, Israel needed real-time satellite imagery. So it started its own satellite program, and in 1988, the OFEC-1 satellite was launched into orbit. Out of the blue, Israel became one of the few nations with independent satellite launching capabilities. Going into space is a remarkable achievement, let alone for a small nation. 
But the underlying factor that has accelerated Israel's technological prowess has been American support. Since 1976, Israel has been the largest annual recipient of US foreign aid. And in 2023, that aid totaled a staggering $130 billion. If this amount were to be adjusted for Israel's annual defense spending, it would mean that almost a quarter of Israel's military budget was and is effectively funded by the United States. This aid has been crucial in nurturing the Israeli arms industry and shaping it into what it is today. However, Israel's unique military and financial relationship with the United States goes both ways, with the latter benefiting from it periodically. For instance, Israeli reconnaissance satellites and air defense systems played a key role during the Gulf War in 1990. When Iraq fired salvos of Scud missiles toward Israel, it shook the military political establishment in both Washington and Tel Aviv. Israeli satellites could track enemy rocket launchers, but as rockets became cheaper, smaller and more readily available, the threat came not only from hostile states, but also from non-state actors, such as Hezbollah and Hamas. Against the backdrop of the Gulf War, Hezbollah and Hamas would fire dozens of rockets at Israeli settlements daily. As this was happening, it became clear that a new kind of air defense was needed to eliminate the threat. So the Israelis pushed for new layers of defensive systems, and within a few years, they delivered three new weapons, the Iron Dome, the Arrow, and David's Sling. Each served a different tactical purpose, but together they neutralized the threat from rockets and missiles, at least in quantifiable terms. The technological supremacy of Israeli satellites and missile defense systems quickly became a household name. Ironically, even France, Britain and America, once reluctant to export arms to Israel, are now eager to import Israeli systems and cut deals. In all, Israel's technological edge has helped it deal with a variety of emerging threats, not just in the physical realm, but also in the domain of cyberspace. Iran's pursuit of nuclear weapons and how the Israelis dealt with it at the time is one such example. That being so, in order to acquire fissile material, the Iranians need to enrich uranium, which is done by centrifuges. However, starting in 2009, Iranian centrifuges began to malfunction one by one. The culprit was a malicious computer worm called Stuxnet a new type of cyber weapon developed jointly by the United States and Israel. Stuxnet essentially hijacked Iran's centrifuges, allowing the controller to adjust the speed of the centrifuge motors to breaking point. Without firing a single shot, Israel's new weapon managed to derail Iran's nuclear program by years. Cyberspace has now become the new frontier of modern warfare, and since the Stuxnet attack, Israel has emerged as a leader in cybersecurity and cyber warfare. In recent years, Israel's persistent technological leapfrog has developed a number of constructive side effects. For one thing, cutting-edge military technologies have transformed it into a nation of startups. Usually, it takes time for military advances to be translated into civilian applications. But in Israel, the process is faster because of the lack of bureaucracy between legislators, investors and academics. Another perk of having a robust military industry is what is known as arms diplomacy. Nations wishing to acquire high-tech weapons from Israel must improve their diplomatic and economic relations as a precondition for gaining access to these weapons. This arms diplomacy has allowed Israel to build strategic relationships in the most unlikely places, including some Arab nations. In turn, arms diplomacy has strengthened Israel's geopolitical hand. But Warfare is constantly changing, and every marvel of technology tends to change the one who employs it. Overconfidence gives a false sense of security, which then makes complacency and hubris the norm. Israel's quest 
for high-tech superiority over low-tech adversaries such as Hamas and Hezbollah has somewhat clouded the judgment of the Israeli intelligence apparatus in the capabilities of its adversaries. That much can be assessed from the recent Hamas attack. Israel believed itself to be virtually invulnerable to a large-scale attack from Hamas. The country built one of the world's most sophisticated border defense systems around the Gaza Strip, bristling with advanced sensors and remote-controlled machine guns. It also deployed a variety of state-of-the-art anti-missile systems, giving Israeli civilians a false sense of security that they would be adequately protected from rocket and artillery attacks from Gaza and southern Lebanon, even in the event of a major conflict. But the Iron Dome air defense system was saturated with thousands of rockets, each costing a small fraction of the Israeli interceptors. The so-called Iron Wall around Gaza was breached and there were far too few Israeli soldiers on the ground to stop the Hamas incursion. The Israeli leadership believed that there was no need for a large number of Israeli boots on the ground given the smart border fence around Gaza. In Israel's case, its fixation on high-tech or cult of technology created a false sense of security. If nothing else, Hamas succeeded in shattering the myth of Israeli invulnerability. And suppose Tel Aviv cannot restore that image of invulnerability and the status quo that existed before, in that case, more and more hostile powers will feel empowered to test the geopolitical waters. In Israel's case, hubris based on technological supremacy led to faulty judgment vis-à-vis -vis the capacities of Hamas. Netanyahu's government acted as if it could have its cake and eat it too, without the need to make any painful trade-offs. It could strive for better relations with its Arab neighbors while convincing itself that it was managing and containing Hamas and its allies with minimal resources. In 2020, the Israel Defense Forces announced the development of a new operational concept called Decisive Victory. It hasn't yet been implemented due to political delays. But overall, the new operational concept aims to change the way Israel fights armed conflicts and redefine victory on the battlefield. The bulk of the concept was based on the premise that superior technology would increase the combat readiness of the Israeli military while also reducing the size of the forces needed to conduct effective military operations. More precisely, the decisive victory concept suggests a multi-domain military built for combined arms operations and supported by artificial intelligence. By use of machine learning, hostile forces would be identified and tracked, and then precise firepower would be autonomously applied. Meanwhile, the size and scale of the ground forces would be reduced further still. In theory, it checked out, but in practice, it proved to be quite different. The recent Hamas attack shows that if a nation's foundational military technologies are incapacitated or overrun and soldiers are absent on the battlefield, the over-reliance on technology becomes a liability as it introduces a single point of failure. Combat-ready soldiers in both quality and quantity remain the most valuable component that is the military machine. Because ultimately, a tank or a drone may take a hill, but only geopolitical foresight can take the horizon. I've been your host Shirvan from Caspian Report. Thank you for watching and Sarol.